Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I also thank uh, uh, Theoretical Sciences Visiting Program uh, for making this visit possible. Uh, so today I'll tell you uh, about um, this uh, subject that I'm uh, getting into uh, relatively recently. Uh, so um, uh, I've been thinking about error correcting uh, codes for uh, maybe three to four years, and then this quantum part is uh, more recent. Um, so this will be, in fact, my first talk on uh, quantum codes. So I try to uh, give a, a version of this talk to, to my wife earlier, uh, two days ago, and she almost divorced me. <laughs> so she... Uh, Actually, she didn't like my presentation at all. Uh, she said, uh, you have to simplify this. This is uh, too much. Uh, I can't understand it. So this is the second version that I prepared. Uh, I don't know if I did a good job or not, but uh, instead of starting the easier way that I thought in the first presentation, I start, decided to start with the more difficult part first, and hopefully it'll get easier, and then it will get complicated again. <laughs> Uh, I hope uh, I'll do a good job though. So let me let me start with the technical, one of the technical uh, parts of my talk. I, the posets are already in the title of my uh, presentation. So a poset is short for a uh, partially ordered set. It's a set with some ordering on it. Uh, we order elements of this set uh, P. And uh, basically, uh, there are three axioms for this order. Uh, these are the conditions that makes this uh, ordering uh, meaningful. Uh, obviously, if we order uh, anything, um, for example, we, we look at our kids, we like some of them better than the other kids. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we joke on the side, uh, we, we want uh, the following conditions. Uh, every element should be less than or equal to itself. Uh, if an element is less than or equal to uh, another element, and if that other element is less than or equal to the first element, they better be equal. This is a natural thing to ask for. And also we want transitivity. If A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, then that should imply A is less than or equal to C. Uh, so we see examples of posets in our daily lives. Uh, for example, ancestry trees, right? So our and ancestors uh, start started multiplying. They had kids, and that those kids had kids, and then suddenly a tree grows like this, branches out. But essentially, it's a partially ordered set. The smallest uh, element of the partially ordered set uh, are our uh, Adam and Eve. Okay, so uh, it's a funny thing. This is a simple mathematical object. However, um, the it, it's surprising. Uh, uh, at least still uh, amazes me, this fact, the number of partially ordered sets with an element uh, is still a big open problem in combinatorics. The answer is not no. So let me, let me give you some uh, examples of posets where uh, we can represent them by uh, diagrams. It's easier to remember that way. So uh, finite posets are easily uh, remembered by their so-called uh, graphs or Hasse diagrams. Uh, let's look at these small uh, cases. If we, if we work with a poset with one element, of course, there is only one node in our graph. Uh, if we have two elements in our set, then we can only have two uh, inequivalent uh, poset structures on that set. Uh, the first poset has uh, one element less than the other. The other poset has uh, both of its elements incomparable with each other. If you look at process structures on three element sets, there are five of them. And these, these are the Hasse diagrams. Four n equals to four, there are 16, and the number grows fairly quickly. All right, so now let's move on to uh, closer to the uh, um, computer science. So, uh, you know, uh, there is an analogy. Uh, in order to be able to drive a car, you don't need to be a mechanic. Just like that, in order to be able to use a computer, you don't need to be a computer scientist. However, it's still good to know how these computers are structured and how they work. Uh, we learned uh, that uh, in undergraduate that uh, 
typical computer has three basic units. The first unit is its brain, CPU, central processing unit. And then there is the main memory unit. And uh, the third unit consists of input and output controllers. These are screens, uh, mouse, and keyboards, and so on. To, uh, to have the brain of our computer, we have these smaller memories called random access memory, RAMs. And there are many types of RAMs in our computer. And uh, one type of RAM called dynamic random access memory is essentially responsible for very fast uh, performance of our computer. Uh, and the way that it works is that it, uh, it stores information on the uh, electric capacitors. So this makes it very fast to transmit uh, small memory units back and forth instead of saving them into main memory unit. And uh, since everything is stored uh, electrically on capacitors, this is very sensitive to um, background radiation and uh, external factors. And uh, also, as you can imagine, if you pull the plug out, uh, DRAM doesn't work. It's not like the memory unit of your computer. Um, so uh, one, uh, one uh, another interesting thing about DRAM uh, that, uh, that I recently learned while preparing this lecture is that there is a big industry around uh, DRAMs. So it turns out that the market size for DRAM uh, in 2023 is over 100 billion US dollars. So companies are investing quite a bit on uh, production of uh, DRAMs. Uh, going back to uh, sensitivity to background radiation, uh, this is a uh, very old uh, report uh, from IBM uh, from 1990s. They mentioned that um, uh, RAMs typically experience one cosmic ray induced error per 256 megabyte of RAM per month. And this was in 1990s. Uh, of course, now with modern technology, we know that uh, these uh, chips are much smaller, so errors are bigger. So th this, this error rate has increased, actually. It didn't decrease. Um, now, uh, another fact is that radiation-related errors uh, increases as you go to higher altitudes. Um, in fact, compared to sea level, uh, if you go up 10 to 12 kilometers high, uh, the uh, average uh, neutron flux increases 300 times more. This means that computers in higher altitudes uh, experience more errors than uh, sea level. Um, so, uh, and this is even worse for quantum computers because I guess there are many different ways of handling quantum computers, but one way is to use superconductors to save bits. And these uh, superconducting uh, circuits are more sensitive to radiation. So even if you are at the sea level, uh, uh, quantum computers are prone to error more than regular uh, DRAMs. So this uh, motivates uh, our discussion. Now, uh, so I would like to get into uh, error correction business. Now, uh, I was looking for good analogies to explain what error correction was about. And uh, while uh, searching math educator stack exchange, I came, uh, uh, I, I came across with this uh, person's uh, comments. Uh, they are very nice. So he suggested following analogies for introducing error correction to the students. He said, you know, as, as we are teachers, academicians, we try to explain stuff to our students, but we often give more examples than necessary, often redundant, thinking that some of the uh, information doesn't reach students. Okay, so there is a lesson to be learned by providing excess information here. Uh, or marriage vows and love letters. You know, oft, lovers often struggle to express their feelings, so they they tell more than necessary about themselves. <laughs> uh, again, this is uh, repeating something. And finally, uh, we see uh, this, the main idea of error correction in mafia movies. The boss says that, Fredo, go take care of Antonio Bellucci. I want him iced, you know, accidents happen. Make him sleep with the fishes. So the point here is that he tells too much, inf too, too, many, too much information hoping that you know, the uh, 
Fredo catches what's intended to be said. And this is really the main idea of error correction. We give redundant, uh, redu we add redundancy to the message and then submit it. And the other end corrects uh, looking at the redundant information. And more diagrammatically, that's how it is done. We have a source for our message. Uh, we encode it, send it through communication channel, decoder receives it and decodes and receiver gets it. For example, here, let's say we have our uh, message uh, XX, XY, Y, X, Y, Y. Our encoder encodes into bits, sequence of bits, submits through an adverse information channel and some of the bits are flipped and we get the wrong uh, sequence. And then a receiver has to figure out what was the original message. All right, so uh, let's assume that our receiver knows the set of all possible code words that it may possibly receive. Uh, here we have a, a, our lookup table. Uh, we will call this a code. Uh, our, in our lookup table, we see all these strings and most of these, uh, all of these are in the lookup table. However, one of them is not. Uh, this is not in the lookup table. So receiver quickly learns that an error occurred during transmission. Uh, this is called error detection. And now, um, so uh, although you can build codes which do not rely on any uh, external structure, uh, it's better to have some sort of algebraic structure on your code so that you can manipulate the code faster uh, to detect errors and correct. So from now on, we will focus on uh, codes or lookup tables that have some additional algebraic structure on it. Um, so uh, by the way, if you, if you forgot uh, what uh, vector space is, so let me quickly refresh your memory. In calculus, we learn vector spaces, but over real numbers. Uh, a vector space is a collection of vectors. Uh, they all have same uh, number of coordinates. Uh, in calculus, we learn vector spaces over real numbers. So we add two, we can add two vectors, subtract two vectors or scale them by real numbers. In, in our error correction business, our alphabet is not, does not consist of real numbers, but rather some discrete objects. So I will focus on these uh, discrete uh, objects that behave like real numbers. They are called finite fields. And I'll discuss uh, vector spaces over finite fields. So zero and one are uh, elements of uh, our, the most basic finite field, uh, which I will denote by F2. F2 as a set has two elements, zero and one. And we do modular arithmetic on, on this set. So we add them, uh, add entries of F2 according to this table and multiply them according to this table. More generally, we can consider a finite field with P elements where P is a prime number. Um, and the, uh, as I said, FP consists of numbers from one to uh, P minus one where P is our prime number. And we have the, addition and multiplication operations similar to this, these two tables. Um, and um, if we want to work with fields which has more than uh, prime number elements, then we can only do it at the expense of taking a power of a prime number. This is a mathematical fact. Uh, if you want to invert multiplicatively elements of a finite field, you have to uh, stay uh, in this range of uh, prime power numbers. Uh, so Finite fields with Q elements where Q is a prime power are obtained as quotients of polynomial rings. Um, so so um, actually this is not something uh, quite uh, grossly abstract. Uh, if, you, if you want to find non-zero elements of a finite field with Q elements, you can, all, you can look at the complex uh, numbers and look at the unit circle in the complex plane. And uh, non-zero elements of a finite field with Q elements essentially are equally, uh, these are, these are uh, complex numbers of this form. So these are roots of unities. For instance, if I want to study a finite field with uh, 25 elements, the non-zero elements of that field will be precisely the 24th roots of unities 
scattered uniformly around the unit circle. And I can multiply these uh, numbers according to complex multiplication, but addition is more complicated. That's, that's what makes it more uh, technical. However, we can do the same arithmetic that we can do with the real numbers. We can add them, multiply, divide, subtract. All right, so what is a, a linear code? A linear code is simply a vector subspace uh, of an n-dimensional vector space over our field, just like vector spaces in calculus. We, we just, in three space, we can take planes or lines. Uh, here, our three space might be uh, three-dimensional vector space over a finite field. Now, uh, it's good to know linear algebra because it tells us that you can translate everything into simple matrix algebra. So instead of working with uh, geometric, uh, maybe uh, counterintuitive uh, higher dimensional vector spaces, you can translate everything into matrices and use simple arithmetic on matrices. And we learn in linear algebra that if you take a k-dimensional vector subspace of an n-dimensional vector space, you can write it as the uh, zero set of some matrix multiplication. So in particular, every code, which is a k-dimensional subspace of an n-dimensional vector space after all, can be written as a set of vectors that we can make zero upon multiplying by an n minus k by n matrix. So for every code C, there is such a matrix H, and C is uniquely determined by this matrix H. And this matrix H is called parity check matrix. Why is it called parity check matrix? Because if you receive an error, you would like to check quickly whether that vector received message is in the, your lookup list or not, right? So you can, in computer, the, the correct way of doing this is you take an element of your lookup list, compare with the received message. If they are not equal, you move to the next vector in the lookup list and so on. So that's very, very costly algorithm. Instead, you can just work with one matrix H. You can multiply your received work with this matrix H. If it is zero, it's in your code. If it is not zero, there is an error. So H is very uh, quick way of checking uh, whether a received code word is in the, uh, in the lookup list or not. All right, so this is very useful. So this is one point where a linearity plays an important role. We can use matrices to check whether received messages are in our lookup list or not. But th uh, th there is more. So I guess I wanted to give a, a, an example here, uh, a typical code over a finite field with four elements. Okay, so here I'm, I'm going to look at uh, F4, which has two to the two elements. And uh, as I mentioned before, non-zero elements of our finite field lives on the unit circle. So these are precisely the third roots of unities. Uh, you can write this in terms of cosines and sines. Uh, and um, so you can multiply these uh, uh, third roots of unity, primitive third roots of unity. With, uh, take it square, you will get complex conjugate uh, number. Here is the multiplication, essentially. To add them, you can use this table. All right, so now our code, so this is one code that you can build on a finite field with four elements. So I'm going to consider vectors of length six, uh, which, which who, and this code should have this particular matrix as its parity check matrix. And now once you know the parity check matrix, uh, you can quickly find the generators. The generators of our matrix C are given by uh, the rows of uh, this uh, other matrix G. Once you know the generating set, you can uh, determine how many elements this uh, code or lookup list have. Uh, since it has three linearly independent rows, our code is going to have uh, four to the three, six to four code words. Turns out that with this code, if you use this particular code, uh, you can detect and correct single digit errors in the sent message. So uh, I would like to explain how this is done. So I move on to the... Uh, Next uh, notion uh, here, uh, metrics or distances will play an uh, important role. 
Uh, what's a metric? Uh, a metric is a, a way of formalizing the notion of a distance. Um, and then we can use metrics to study convergence, continuity, boundedness, topology of our underlying space. In this context, the most important, I shouldn't say most important, the whole point of my talk is that this particular metric is not the most important one. There are many other metrics to study. Uh, so there is one basic distance in coding theory. It's called the Hemming distance. And Hemming distance or Hemming metric uh, is defined as follows. Take two vectors of equal length. The, the distance between these two vectors is the number of coordinates where the entries of these two vectors are different from each other. So this defines the distance. Then we can define the weight of a single vector as simply the non-zero coordinates of that vector. This is essentially the distance between the vector to the origin. Okay, now that we have the notion of a distance for uh, the codes over finite fields, we can talk about balls and spheres, some geometric objects. Uh, so packing radius of a code is the largest integer such that the balls of radius R centered around the code words uh, are all pairwise disjoint. Remember, C lives in n-dimensional vector space but it's k-dimensional, meaning that C has fewer vectors than a total number of vectors in this big vector space. And I'm putting balls around each of equal length balls around each of the vectors in C. I'm blowing those balls until they almost touch each other. As soon as they touch, and if the radius is uh, integer, then uh, I would like to take that radius uh, as my pecking radius. I'm picking the space by these balls centered around uh, vectors in C. Let me give you an example. Now I'm looking at a uh, two dimensional vector space, FQ2, and brown nodes represent the vectors of my code. And I'm putting balls around my uh, code vectors, code words. Um, so see, these are unit. Unit balls. If I take radius two balls centered around code words, these guys are going to touch each other, uh, and they will have a joint common point. But I don't want this. They, I want them to be mutually disjoint. So this is the largest integer radius. One is the largest integer radius such that all balls of uh, radius R around code words are disjoint. Okay. So packing radius for this particular code is one. Now, uh, let's say we send a message using this code, and we send three vectors. Two of the, two of the uh, code words hit on the nose uh, are uh, code, ver code, code words in C. But one of them landed itself on the, uh, on the unit ball. Not quite a code word, but it landed on outside C. So then our receiver or dec uh, decoder starts to, uh, realize, starts to realize that there is an error. Uh, so, okay, now we found that there is an error because this is not in the code space C. How do we fix this error? We simply send it to the nearest code word. And uh, our error is corrected uh, by sending uh, by nearest neighbor uh, decoding algorithm here. All right, so as I said, uh, packing radius is uh, the common radius, uh, smallest integer that all balls around centered code words are disjoint. And this is closely related to minimum of all distances between elements of C. Uh, if you stare at this picture, you will realize that the here, the minimum distance is going to be one, two, three, four, right? For this example, the minimum distance between code words uh, is four. You go this way, four units, or you go this way, four units. So this is the minimum uh, distance between two code words in C. And uh, packing radius is simply the floor of minimum distance minus one over two. Indeed, here we had four, four minus one is three, Three over two is one half. Its floor is one. 
All right, so now we can make this theorem definition. If we take uh, a code in an n-dimensional vector space and our code has k dimensions, and let's say the minimum distance of codeverse in C is D, now C can detect and correct at least D minus one over two floor errors, just like in this example, because if a erroneous message falls into this uh, ball of radius, the packing radius, then we can fix the error by simply sending this uh, code, wrong code word to the center of the ball. Uh, so if this happens, if the minimum distance is D, then we say that our code is an NKD code. Um, so these parameters, NKD, are related to each other. And this is one of the most fundamental theorems of uh, error correction. Uh, this is known as uh, singleton's bound. It says that if you take, uh, in fact, this theorem works for not necessarily linear codes. It says that if you take a linear code in an n-dimensional vector space, then uh, the relationship between the size of D and and the minimum distance is given by this inequality. In particular, if you have a linear code and KD code, then this K is less than or equal to n minus d plus one. It's a, it's a very fundamental inequality, very easy to prove. Um, and, and as an immediate corollary of this, uh, actually, uh, once you stare at this inequality for a while, that you ask yourself, well, are the codes making this inequality, equality, important? And that's a very, very basic question to ask. And the answer is yes, these codes are um, maximum distance separable, uh, meaning that once you fix N and K, D has to be ma maximized. So, so the, hence the name for these codes. So bigger the minimum distance is, more errors you can correct, right? So uh, obviously you want this inequality to be an equality to get, so it's speak better codes. All right, so we'll call such codes MDS codes. A most basic example of an MDS code, it was discovered in 1960 uh, by Reed and Solomon, so hence the name. They're called Reed-Solomon codes. These are MDS codes. They are essentially obtained by taking polynomials of degree at most k minus one and evaluating at the non-zero elements of our underlying field. We simply pick one uh, generator of the non-zero elements of our field, call it alpha, and then take any polynomial of degree at most k minus one and evaluate that polynomial on the powers of alpha, you will get a vector here. So I forgot to close this parenthesis. This is a vector of length um, Q minus one here. Then you get, you get the so-called Reed-Solomon codes. I must mention this, that uh, Reed-Solomon codes were used in uh, uh, deep space uh, communication, in particular Voyager 1 used uh, Reed-Solomon codes for communi uh, correcting communication errors. And uh, at the end, I will show some pictures that re, uh, Voyager sent. And it uses this uh, Reed Solomon codes to correct errors during uh, information transfer, uh, transfer. All right. So now uh, we move to our next metric. So far, we talked about Hemming metrics. Now I would like to tell you about the Posset metrics. Uh, this is a silent uh, revolution, in my opinion. Uh, this business started uh, around uh, early 90s, uh, but uh, in 95, uh, 1995, uh, it, made, it was made precise by Broaldi, uh, Gravers, and Lawrence. Um, um, so let me just uh, get down to the theory instead of horsing around. So to define a poset metric, I fix a poset, uh, and then given a vector, in my vector space, I would like to define weight of that vector with respect to the poset. How do I do this? Uh, let's, let's, let's focus on this example. This is my poset given by its Hasse diagram. And then I receive this code word C. I look at the non-zero entries of the code word. They occur at the fifth and the sixth positions. And I look at my poset and pick the fifth and sixth vertices. And then I take every element in the poset that are equal to or less than these two guys. So this is the old red marked region, okay? So this is the support of this code word in this poset. Yes. 
Uh, because this is uh, my my non-zero coordinates are at, uh, are fifth and sixth coordinates. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, this this is an order ideal, meaning that if I take anything here, anything below will be in the same set. So support support set is essentially an order ideal in my poset. Then I take its size as my weight. So weight of my vector c is simply the size of the order ideal generated by the indices of the non-zero entries of my vector in the poset. This is quite related to Hemingway um, in the sense that if I want to capture, recover Heming distance by a poset, I, all I need to do is to take a anti-chain. The poset where no two elements are comparable, then the ordinary, uh, then the poset support agrees with the ordinary support of a vector. So Heming, Heming metric weight is a special case of poset metric weight. All right, so now, now I can define my poset metric as the uh, distance between two ve vectors. Uh, and then I take the poset weight of the difference. So this defines a metric. Uh, a linear code together with this new metric determined by poset P will be called a P code. Here's an example. Let's look at this extended binary Hemming code, H3 hat. It's the unique code with these parameters. So it is, it, the vectors have length eight. The vector space dimension of H3 is four. Minimum distance is four. Now you can work out the vectors in that vector space. You find all these 16 uh, vectors. If you use Hemming distance, you find that there is only one code word with X to the zero weight, so which is one. So, and it's zero, 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 zero. So weight of this guy is zero. Now you, you, you just look at these vectors and look, calculate the Hemming weight. You find that 14 of them has weight four. And then there is one vector of weight eight, and it is this one. All right, so this is the uh, weight generating function of my extended binary code with respect to Hemming weight. What happens if I choose other posets? If I choose this star poset, Weight generating function is uh, this guy. It says that there is one code word with zero weight. Again, same vector, zero, 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 zero. And then there are now four code words, uh, sorry, seven code words of weight four, seven code words of weight five, and one code word of weight eight. If I use this poset, uh, the total order, then suddenly I find that there is only one vector of weight five, two vectors of weight six, four vectors of weight seven, eight vectors of weight eight. So in this particular example, the minimum distance has increased. Uh, in 2008, Winan Kim uh, discovered that there is an analog of Singleton's theorem, and they proved they observed this inequality. This is Singleton's theorem for poset metrics. Uh, if you look at the minimum distance with respect to a poset P, then it satisfies a similar inequality. And if this inequality is an equality, then we will call it an MDS P code. Um, what's striking here is that when and Kim were able to show this theorem, give me any old code C with parameters N and K, I can give you a poset P for which your old crappy code becomes an MDS poset with respect to the poset metric. But this is quite remarkable because if you care about MDS codes, this is the way to go. This tells you that you can produce a lot of MDS codes using posets. And indeed, for our binary, extended binary Hemming code, whose parameter is 844, this is not an MDS code because remember, singleton bound says n minus k plus one is to be d. Here, d is four. So eight minus four is four, plus one is five. Five is not four. So this is not an MDS code with respect to Hemming weight. But if I use chain C, then the, I know that minimum distance is five. This becomes an MDS code. 
Okay, now I would like to apply this theory to quantum error correction. Uh, I'm, I'm no physicist. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but I'm working with these objects and they seem natural from mathematics viewpoint. So uh, for me, uh, the binary states zero and one in classical computers can be replaced by um, quantum states, which are simply complex column vectors. Um, and then there's this funny notation, bracket notation, which is very helpful. Um, uh, I'm going to replace this uh, unit normalized basis element by uh, zero uh, bracket, and then uh, I'll denote this other column vector by one bracket. Then when I write 1011001 in bracket, I mean the tensor product of these column vectors. Okay, so what's happening here? What's happening is that I'm basically using my binary alphabet, 0, 1, to encode certain basis vectors in the uh, complex uh, plane. Uh, and then uh, I'm encoding their tensor products uh, efficiently. That's, that's how I view it. Of course, there are better physical interpretations of this notation and how it is used. In particular, if I look at uh, N tensor product of C to the Q by itself, I could take uh, a basis for C to the Q. And then, uh, so C to the Q can be viewed as essentially a set of all functions of finite field FQ mapping to uh, complex numbers. So C to the Q can be viewed as a set of all functions on, uh, from FQ to C. And then uh, for every uh, finite field element, I can get one basis. So I can create a basis for C to the Q using finite fields. And then I can take their tensor products. Okay, uh, what's the big deal? So now I will define uh, a quantum NK code as simply a K-dimensional vector space of this huge vector space. So this is not an ordinary product, this is tensor product. So dimensions are not added, but rather multiplied. So the dimension of this big tensor product vector space is Q to the N. So I have a Q to the N dimensional ambient vector space and I'm taking capital K dimensional subspace of it. So a priori, uh, okay, so K is going to be some power of Q or, uh, or something like this. So K is going to be big also. And here, uh, let me see uh, just quickly. Okay, so here uh, I care more about um, error operators than error themselves. Uh, the, the reason is uh, that um, I cannot repeat my um, uh, classical methods in the setup because of the essentially tensor product. So there is, a, there is a deeper reason here why I cannot use my classical coding theory business here. Uh, uh, essentially it's the no cloning theorem. So I cannot simply copy uh, uh, information um, and repeat uh, in tensor products. So there is a very basic observation called no cloning theorem. It prevents me from uh, adding redundancy as we did in the ordinary case. So instead, what we study is instead of studying uh, code words themselves, uh, we study the error operators that act on the codes. Okay, I, I slaughter this business, but this is the easiest way to uh, explain what's the mathematics behind this uh, business. So um, now let's look at the error operators. Uh, so for each coordinate of this tensor product here, I have uh, several error operators. I'm going to denote them by uh, X's and Z's. The X error operators uh, operate by adding finite field elements to whatever indexing set I'm using, indexing vector I'm using. Okay, so X behaves like translation in the indexing data. And uh, Z operator uh, behaves like scaling in the indices, scaling with respect to a, a appropriate root of unity. And uh, these are my two uh, error operators in one of the coordinate, in one of the tensor factors of my big tensor product. 
Uh, here is a worked out example for my uh, four element field. Um, I can define these particular error operators this way. Um, then, uh, by the way, uh, if you if you get too bored, you can start you know multiplying these things together, and you realize they actually generate a finite group. Uh, but this can be extended to n tensor products as well. So what we do is simply take tensor products of our error operators, uh, and then we can do the same multiplication called tensor factor wise. We can multiply x u one with z u one, but uh, when, when we apply x and z, we don't need to operate on the same way indexing set. We can change our indexing uh, sets to A and B, and we can define this uh, n-fold tensor products of error operators. So we get this set products of these error operators. Uh, this is typically called nice error bases. And these nice error bases generates, uh, as I said, a finite group, uh, typically denoted by G sub n. Uh, so if you forget this scaling, it's not a group. Uh, if you add this uh, scaling, it becomes a group. Um, we will call GN uh, an error group, and it's a P group, uh, meaning that every element is a power of P. Um, it's not an abelian group, but turns out all subgroups of GN that are interest to us are abelian. All right, so stabilizer codes. Now we are ready to discuss quantum codes in more detail. Uh, so let's take a finite subgroup of our error group. Uh, I will look at the uh, fixed vectors under this uh, finite uh, subgroup. So I'm looking at all elements of this huge vector space that are fixed by every element of this subgroup S. The fixed set has a structure of a complex vector space, it's Q, and Q is called a stabilizer code. Uh, by the way, it's very interesting. If S is not the full group, then uh, it turns out that uh, S is an abelian group uh, and it doesn't intersect the center uh, of uh, our full error group. Uh, okay, so these guys do not capture all quantum codes. They are very special in the sense that uh, I'm looking at these particular stabilized codes, which are quantum codes, but it turns out that for any quantum code, you can find a stabilizer code that includes the captures that code at the expense of minimum distance being slightly bigger, uh, smaller. Uh, and then, uh, the, in fact, that stabilizer code is attached to arbitrary quantum code by taking the fixed point set of the stabilizer subgroup of the original quantum code. Okay, so now, just like as in the ordinary uh, error correction, there is a notion of a distance, so to speak, or weights of errors. Uh, and this is called the symplectic uh, weight of the error. So take an uh, error operator G. So this G lives in S. Its symplectic weight is going to be N minus the, uh, the coordinates of G that act as identity on the transmitted message. So uh, you can see how POSET metric will come in here now. Uh, but first, let me mention a quantum singleton bound. So we are going to say that a quantum code uh, has a minimum distance t if the uh, quantum code detects all error operators whose symplectic weight less than d, but, but this q cannot detect an error of symplectic weight d. This is our notion of a minimum distance for the error operators. And then if, if you find, if you determine D, then we will say that our quantum code has parameters N, K, D, or actually I, I should restrict my attention to stabilizer codes here, but it's okay. Uh, now, uh, early in the theory, development of the theory. So this quantum coding theory started by uh, Peter Shore in 1995, who discovered this, uh, even though you have no cloning theorem, you can still build these things uh, analyzing the errors. Uh, shortly after his discovery in 95, uh, Knud and uh, Laflamme uh, wrote uh, a nice article where they proved the Q version of the singleton's bound. Uh, they said that if you take a, a NKD stabilizer code, then it will satisfy, uh, its parameters will satisfy singleton's bound in almost. Uh, there is this 
two here, and then instead of adding one, you add two. But if this inequality is satisfied, then uh, your stabilizer code will be called a quantum MDS stabilizer code. Um, now, I'll, I would like to do this with posets. So now I define uh, the poset weight of an error operator to be the cardinality. So, uh, okay, so uh, I forgot to write n minus the cardinality of the ideal of P that is generated by the indices of the non identity uh, tensor components of G. Uh, so that should be n minus this number. Uh, so remember, the uh, symplectic weight is n minus. Ah, okay, okay, it's correct. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm conf I'm getting myself uh, confused. There's, there are no typos. So here, a uh, symplectic weight is n minus the coordinates. The tensor coordinates are being identity operators. Both x, x i, x a j and z b j are zeros. Setting them zeros makes them those operators identity operators. Okay, this is a symplectic weight. This is almost Hemming, Hemming distance. I'm defining it in the same way. Uh, I'm taking the cardinality of the ideal that is generated by the indices of those entries where I have zeros in the support. So it's almost straightforward modification of the poset metric uh, distance. Now, uh, then I can define my uh, stabilizer poset codes. The uh, same way uh, as uh, the ordinary stabilizer quantum codes defined. Um, so I say that a, a stabilizer, uh, so a given quantum code is, is a stabilizer poset P code with parameters N, K, D. If Q detects all errors in GN of P weight less than D, but cannot detect an error of P weight D. All right, then uh, there's a technical definition I'm going to skip for a second. Um, then, um, then th there is an important uh, result uh, due to uh, Calderbank, uh, Shore, uh, Sloan, and Reigns. Uh, they basically, uh, in the binary case, they found a relationship between quantum stabilizer codes and the uh, additive codes. So additive codes are not necessarily linear codes, but uh, time, uh, uh, but they, they behave like um, almost like linear codes. Um, uh, basically an additive code is simply a subgroup of uh, product of, uh, of a given abelian group. Um, so what I, what I wrote here is a version of this result of uh, Calderbank, Grains, Shore, and Sloan. Um, uh, it says the following. So if you, if you take a stabilizer group of a, a stabilizer poset uh, with respect to a poset metric, then we can map the error group. Uh, th this is done in the classical setup too. I'm just using same map. Uh, the, there is a map from the error group to two n dimensional vector space over our finite field. The image turns out to be an additive code, self orthogonal additive code with respect to symplectic trace product. Now, okay, so far everything is trivial. I didn't say anything new, uh, but then uh, what happens is that if I use, I can also define a poset matrix on additive codes. It turns out that a poset matrix on the additive codes agrees with the, uh, error weight that I defined in the previous slide. So this sorts of, um, this is a lemma that gets me going with this theory. Um, then uh, I can prove uh, statements that are uh, versions of uh, Huynh uh, Kim. I can, uh, if I show uh, a version of the singleton bound using poset metrics for quantum stabilizer codes. And uh, the, another statement that I can prove is that uh, um, if I take uh, an MDS stabilizer P code, then that uh, map that I mentioned previously uh, gives me two MDS codes in the image and, and vice versa, in fact. So I can, uh, I can characterize uh, 
uh, stabilizer MDS uh, quantum codes by studying uh, MDS uh, additive P codes. And finally, I can show that um, this uh, result of Yun and Kim about producing a poset for making a given code an MDS code, I can do it for the additive codes. Hence, I can show that given a stabilizer quantum code with parameters with some minimum distance, whatever it is, I can find a poset that makes this quantum code an MDS stabilizer P code. Um, and uh, I think uh, I have some other results. I put them in the appendix, but uh, I wanted to mention uh, one more uh, theorem that addresses one uh, issue that David raised in his wonderful talk last week. He, he was skeptic about uh, what we can uh, achieve using uh, quantum, uh, quantum uh, uh, he didn't refer to uh, error correction in his talk, but he raised the question, what can we not do with uh, classical setup, with the quantum setup, uh, right? So there is a, uh, so, so in response to that, uh, I thought about the following uh, fact. Uh, the question is, to what extent we can recover stabilizer codes from classical linear codes instead of using uh, these additive codes? Uh, the, uh, it looks like there's a precise answer uh, that builds on a, a result of Hoofman uh, from 2013, who counted uh, the FQ linear FQ to the T additive codes. And he found that if they are self-orthogonal with respect to trace alternating form, their number is given this way. So if I now insist on FQ linearity in my setup, I can count uh, the uh, number of FQ rational points of flag varieties, and this, this number is well known. Then I can compare these two summands to see how much of these self-orthogonal uh, self -orthogonal FQ, F, uh, linear uh, additive FQ square codes come from uh, linear codes. And it looks like the following uh, equality holds. There is a quadratic equation polynomial. If this quadratic polynomial has a solution in this range, then for every sufficiently large prime Q, almost surely every stabilizer code can be obtained from a nested pair of classical codes with parameters NK1 and K2. Difference of K1 and K2 gives this K. Otherwise, there exists a stabilizer code which cannot be obtained from linear codes. So it looks like you can do so much with linear codes, but not everything. So quantum, there are quantum codes that cannot be obtained from uh, linear codes. And this builds on uh, the CSS, uh, well-known CSS construction. So I think I should stop uh, for now. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, click on this link. I mentioned that this uh, read, uh, yeah, it's opening. I mentioned that these read Solomon codes were used. Uh, darn it, darn it, darn it, darn it. I don't need all these. Okay, yeah. So this is the wiki website about Voyager 1. And then um, here are some pictures that it used. Uh, it took uh, near Saturn, uh, Jupiter, and Sandas. And uh, I believe uh, Reed Solomon codes were uh, used uh, for securing, uh, you know, uh, uh, transmitted messages. So, okay, this is the real end. <laughs> Thank you. Have a microphone, yeah. Um, okay, so I don't think I really understood exactly. Um, so in the classical case, you you have the received code words, yes, and then you're using this post-set ordering to assign some kind of distance 
like how far is the received bit string from a code word of the code, and then you're using this directly in your decoding, right? Um, but in the quantum case, the host state ordering is on the error operators. Yes. But I can't see the error operator. All I can see is the, the syndrome from the stabilizer measurements. Okay. So I, how does this host set on the error operators inform the decoding? Yeah. So I go to a corresponding additive word, additive code word. Okay. And that lemma that I had, uh, I, I couldn't explain very well, but that lemma says that that uh, poset weight I put on the error uh, operators, mm -hmm. error operators can be translated to uh, a poset weight on the additive code word. Okay, but I also can't see the, the code words of the quantum code, right? Uh, All I have is the stabilizer measurements, unless I want to destructively measure every qubit. Correct, uh, but this is the same as uh, Hemming. Uh, can you do this with the Hemming? Uh, the ordinary symplectic way. Yeah, but so this is why, like, for when you when you consider like a decoder for a quantum code, mm -hmm. it will correct up to some certain Hamming weight that yes. it's, you like have to show this in the proof, right? Sure. So I I don't see yeah. how just like defining yeah. Uh, so like, do you have examples of how defining a post on the error operators gives you like better decoding in some specific case? Yeah, so I just uh, follow the proofs for the Hemming case and I produce some versions of it. Uh, sorry. Um, So to um, let's see, right? Did I put these proofs? Yeah, I can. I can explain uh, this maybe once after this talk is over. We can sit down and uh, I can okay. try to find it. But uh, the the way that I proved, literally, I took the quantum poset paper. Uh, uh, especially the one uh, um, Ketkar Klepener paper. I looked at their proofs, and if I make these poset definitions, I could modify their arguments appropriately. Sometimes I had to come up with new arguments, but it just worked. Okay. Uh, so if they're, I mean, at least I can logically say that whatever I did is correct, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, answering your uh, question. Okay. Okay, maybe so, we can. Yeah, yeah so we can if, if, if what these people are doing is correct, uh, mine okay. <laughs> are okay. also correct. I'm, I'm doing something, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if I can address. Uh, yeah, we have to maybe talk. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Um, so I have a question about this cell limb stuff. Um, so you have Raj D and also. The dual A or something? Yes. But I, I, I couldn't get the definition of the dual A, yeah. which is not just right dual port. Yeah. So this is a, a alternating uh, trace form. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. So that that perp mm -hmm. uh, uh, is the orthogonal, the dual of the code with respect to this uh, form. Ah, uh, so with, with so, specific. Um, yeah. So this uh, like, this form exists on f q squared to the n, and then uh, I take a code d there, and then I take its uh, dual with respect to this uh, inner product. Mm. Yeah. And I, I denote it by uh, yeah. perp a. Yeah. OK, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you very much. Sure. I don't know if it's forwards or backwards now, but can you go to that last slide you had before your appendices? Before. Before the appendices, sorry. Oh, before the appendices, about sure. About the MDS, uh, your, your results about these yeah. MDS additive and MDS complexity. Are these, the way you phrase them is just there exists. Is, uh, are your proofs constructive? Can you construct? Yes, them? yes, I can construct. Uh, and there are uh, many posets, in fact, not just one. Mm -hmm. There are many posets that makes a given code uh, an MDS code. Then you can ask which one of those MDS codes uh, are better than the others. So there, there are new hierarchies showing up now. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Any other questions or any questions online? If not, then let's thank Mahir once more. Thank you. And there'll be a TSVP 